everyone who is a parent or has been a parent knows how difficult it is to be a parent. Is there any parent anywhere who has never made an unwise decision with their children? There may be, but I reflect back on my time as a parent, which is still going on, and there are things that I wish I had done differently. And it's not that I wanted to do wrong or wanted to make a bad decision, but it's difficult sometimes, isn't it? Everyone wants their child to do the best and to be the best, but there's a fine line between constructive encouragement and destructive criticism. There's that fine line that you've got to try and figure out where you want to encourage your children to do right, but you don't want them to, to just scrape by, but you, you don't want to destroy them either. That's, that's difficult, I think. And it's hard to know what to do exactly, perfectly and flawlessly in the heat of any moment. That's why it's best to prepare beforehand. Because in the heat of the moment, it's hard to say. But I'm of the persuasion that the Bible teaches you can only get out of something what's in there. So if you don't have all kinds of garbage in there, as a parent, when your children don't do what you want, garbage is not going to come out. Tonight we're going to discuss one of the greatest parents who ever lived. In fact, she was the mother of the only sinless human being who ever lived. Now you hadn't thought about that, have you? Tonight we're talking about Bible characters from A to Z and we've made it to the letter M and tonight we're going to talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary was a great mother. How do I know? Look at her son. He turned out all right, didn't he? Three things we're going to talk about tonight about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Number one, we're going to talk about the purity of Mary. Mary was a pure person. We'll give three good reasons, three good scriptural reasons as to the Bible does teach that. And then number two, we'll talk about the perseverance of Mary. How would you act if you knew your child was going to be treated the way hers was? Would you stick in there or would you stop that? And then number three, we'll make some practical application and some lessons we can learn from Mary. That's what we intend to do, so let's just go ahead and get started. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to the book of Luke, chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, we'll begin here in verse number 26 as we begin to discuss the purity of Mary. When you begin looking at the Bible, even before you get out of the book of Genesis, it is made clear from the scriptures that the Messiah would be the seed of woman, God would dwell in the tents of Shem, and the scepter would not depart from Judah. Those are all messianic prophecies, even in the book of Genesis, but when you think about it, of all the Hebrews who are of the tribe of Judah, what was so great about Mary? Why then? Why this woman? Why now? We'll give you three good reasons from the text here. In the first place, she was a respectable person. Look at Luke 1, And in the sixth month, that is of Elizabeth's pregnancy. You cannot date the time frame and, and narrow it down to when Jesus was actually born. So in the sixth month here, is in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Elizabeth was the mother of John the Baptist. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. First off, when you see the word espoused here, it means and it's far more serious than what we may consider to be engaged. When you look at what Matthew records, when Joseph finds out what's going to happen, he was minded to put her away. So this was not a fully consummated marriage, but Mary was a respectable person because in principle she was married, though not totally, and it's a different culture, different customs than what we have, but she was still, in spite of being a spouse, what was she still? She was still a virgin, wasn't she? Some people in today's world look at it as, well, I'm going to marry him anyway, so 
What does it matter? It matters. It matters to God. So Mary was a respectable person in that she was espoused, in principle married, but not totally all the way. It's more than just our being engaged. And she still, according to the Bible, was a virgin. Mary is the virgin of Isaiah 7 and verse 14. Behold, a virgin, literally the virgin, shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Way back yonder in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah prophesied of this Mary. Now, one thing that the Bible is silent about, but it's, it's always intrigued my interest, and maybe it has yours. How old was Mary? How old was Mary? In almost everything that I picked up, and almost everything that I looked at, everything asserts that she was between 12 and 14 years of age. I don't know if that's true or not. I know that the Bible, as we continue on down, calls her a young woman. Blessed art thou among women. Now, I want you to think about that for just a second. Let's assume for just a second that Mary was 12 years old. You read through this text and you can't come up with any other conclusion other than that's one of the most mature 12-year-olds I've ever heard of in my life. So if she was 12 years old, she is to be commended for having the level of maturity that she had. However, if she was older than that, 22, 32, I, I don't know. There's no way to determine that. She made it through those tough teenage years as a virgin. She did. Now, whether she was, let's say she was 12, she has a level of maturity that I know I didn't have at 12. Maybe you did, but I didn't. And if she was beyond the age of 12, maybe in her late teenage years or maybe in her early 20s, she made it through that emotional roller coaster known as the teenage years, and she remained a virgin. There's a lesson there, and you'll hear that again for sure. Mary was a respectable person and she was most assuredly a virgin when Jesus was born. Now, continuing on down through the text, Mary was also a righteous person. Look in this same book, same chapter, but verse 28. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. Verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. All human beings are the offspring of God, according to Acts 17, 29. But at some point, our personal sin. What do you mean by personal sin? Individual sin. Not anything anyone else did. Not something that I inherited from my daddy, which is not possible as far as sin goes. But my, due to my personal sin, at some point, due to your personal sin, all of us either have been or will be separated from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 and 1 John 3, 4. So where Mary is told plainly, thou art highly favored. What does that imply? She's in favor with God Almighty. Put your finger right there and let's look at Proverbs 14. Favor and righteousness are linked together in the scriptures. Look at me, Proverbs 14 and verse 9. Mary was a righteous person. How do you know she was a righteous person? Proverbs 14, 9. Fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous... There is favor. Now, while favor and righteousness are not exactly the same thing, they go hand in hand. Mary was found favorably, found to be favorably in God's eyes. Therefore, Mary was a righteous person. And when you understand that respectability and righteousness also go hand in hand, do you see why God chose Mary? But there's another thing that we can notice here about the purity of Mary. She was a reasonable person. Skip on down with me here to Luke 1 and verse 38. We won't look at everything in this text. But look at Luke 1 and verse 38. She's told what's going to happen, what's going to be. 
plainly by an angel of the Lord. And in verse 38, And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. How many people today read, hear, understand God's written message and are not reasonable to it? You look back at what John the Baptist's daddy did in this same chapter. He had to spend a little time not being able to speak. But Mary, that didn't happen, did it? Why? Whether she was 12 years old, 22 years old, I don't know how old she was. She accepted the word of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. Could you imagine if Mary had said, no, nah, you, you got the wrong one. <laughs> I hear what you're saying, but that's, that's not me. I, I can't do this. What? Maybe a little different story, had All of us need to think that we have a choice to make with every gospel sermon we hear. Mary had a choice to make when this angel delivered unto her the message of Jehovah. What was she? She was reasonable. You reason every time you hear a sermon. You will either reason correctly or you will reason incorrectly. Mary reasoned correctly. And the purity of Mary, the mother of Jesus, is unquestioned by those accepting biblical inspiration. Do you believe that Mary was a pure individual? I do. Why do I believe that? Because the Bible says it. Now, number two. Let's talk about the perseverance of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Let's look here in Luke 2, beginning in verse 41. We won't really read this either, but I think you're more familiar with this. When you look in Luke 2 and verse 19, Mary pondered things in her heart. She would observe things, and not only would she observe it, she would think about it. She pondered things in her heart. Do you know what happens here in Luke 2, 41 to 50? This is the only account of Jesus' childhood outside of his being a, I guess you'd say a baby, small child at least. This is really the only account of his, what we could even consider childhood, you could say. And again, that's not taken into account his birth or the flight to Egypt or any such like. But they go to the temple. Jesus gets, he stays at the temple. They go off and they leave Jesus. And then it, it hits them a little later. Jesus sitting with us. So they go back and you know what they find him doing. He's sitting in the temple. He's reasoning about the scriptures. And look at verse 49. I wonder if she pondered this. And we'll see what the text says. And he said unto them, Jesus said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. But look at verse 51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Now, even though they may not have understood it then, at some point they figured out this is the Lamb of God. Our son, Jesus, is the Lamb of God. Now, what is strongly implied in the Bible, strongly implied, is that Joseph and Mary knew the scriptures. Well, where is it strongly implied? Luke 2.52. And Jesus increased in wisdom. How did he increase in wisdom? The same way we do. And stature. How did he increase in stature? The same way we do. And in favor with God and man. How did he increase? The same way we do. Joseph and Mary taught him. They taught him what? They taught him the scriptures. You cannot teach what you do not know. How did Jesus say what he said in Luke 2, 49? They taught him the scriptures. Now let's look at some Old Testament scriptures as we're talking about the perseverance of Mary. Go with me to the Psalms. If you paid attention this morning for our scripture reading, we're going to look at it again. Look at me in Psalm 22. At what point did Mary figure out these Old Testament scriptures are about my son? This is about my son, Jesus. 
What would you do if you knew these scriptures were about your child? What would you do? Look at this. Isaiah, or rather, Psalm twenty-two, fourteen. 14. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. A potsherd is a broken piece of pottery. And my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast my lots upon my and cast lots upon my vesture. Do you think Mary realized that was about her son? Sooner or later she did. What would you do about that? What would you do about that? Think about it. Would we hang in there and realize that our child is going to be treated this way or would we stop it? Would you stop it? Would you let someone treat your child this way? Well, guess what? There's more. Go with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 50. Implied in the Bible is the fact that Joseph and Mary knew the scriptures. What scriptures would they have known? The Old Testament scriptures. She was visited miraculously by an angel. Listen to what she was told. When do you think she figured this out? Something to think about. Would you stick in there or would you stop it? Isaiah 50 and verse 6. Chapter 50 and verse 6. Would you let anyone treat your boy this way? Or would you stop it? I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that did what? Plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from what? Shame and spitting? You know, Brock Shank's opinion, the low down, the sorriest thing in the world you could ever do is spit on somebody. That's bad. And the Jews looked at it that way too. If you knew that your child was going to be spit on, would you let that happen? Would you stop it? Do you not think Mary had to persevere? Do you think that at some point, wherever it was, however old she was, she had to realize this is what my son is going to have to go through? Now, what would your attitude be with regard to that? Sign him up. I don't think so. That'd be difficult, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be difficult? Would we hang in there and see our child treated this way? Or would we cause it not to occur? Flip a few pages to Isaiah 53. If you ever want to read something about Jesus, read Isaiah 53. At what point in her life do you think that Mary figured out that Isaiah 53 was about her son? Do you see that? What would you do? We may try to throw off all of humanity and take him and hide him, wouldn't we? You ain't taking my son. Well, you see, Mary had to persevere. She had to hang in there. By implication, she knew these scriptures. At what point? I don't know at what point. But by the end, she figured it out. Look at Isaiah 53 and verse 7. This is about, what if this was about your son? He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought. This image in the Jewish mind would burn in. He is led as a lamb. Lamb to what? The slaughter. Who is that speaking about? Mary's son, Jesus. When did she figure this out? I don't know exactly, but she figured it out. What would you do? Your firstborn. Would you sign him up and say, yeah, here he goes. I know. There he goes as a lamb to the slaughter. Yeah. It'd be hard, wouldn't it? Indeed. Very much so. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he, what? Openeth not his mouth. Do you think that Mary realized that Isaiah 53, the entire chapter, was about her son? Do you think Mary had to persevere and hang in there 
and resist what would have been the temptation. Wouldn't you have had temptation to hide him? To run off, never look back, and say, man, this is, this is how they're going to treat my son? Let's just go off, son. Let's get, let's get gone. Let's get out of here. Did she? No, she didn't. The perseverance of Mary, the mother of Jesus, is unquestioned by those who accept the Bible as the inspired word of God. Now, number three. Let's make some practical application of this. Let's, let's give some practical lessons we can learn from Mary, the mother of Jesus. Here's number one. Mary realized the preciousness of remaining a virgin. Yeah, I said virgin again. You need, to em, you need to stress that and burn that into your children's minds. Virgin. You're a virgin. You're going to stay a virgin until after you get away from wherever you are getting married. Burn that into their minds. Why? Somebody taught Mary something, didn't they? Some today almost look at the opposite sex as a, as a car. Would you buy a car you didn't test drive? Well, why would you marry somebody that you didn't already know everything about? Let me tell you why. Because sex outside of marriage is sinful. When you lose your virginity, it's gone. They may teach you in high school that you can go back and get a second whatever. No. When it's gone, it's gone. You keep it until someone is going to commit the rest of their life to you. Somebody needs to teach that. Teach it clearly and teach it plainly. Let me tell you something plainly. Your children, just like mine, are going to learn about sex from somebody somewhere. Mine are going to learn from me. You hear that? I already have had to sign a paper for my son. He's already going to be exposed to some things in the fourth grade. They're going to learn it from somebody. Who would you rather them learn it from? Would you rather look at me cross-eyed when I say sex from behind the pulpit? Or you want to hear it from some teacher that's going to teach them something that the Bible doesn't teach. You need to think about that, brethren. We need to stress the importance of what it means to be a virgin and to remain a virgin. The Bible teaches plainly in 1 John 5, 19 that the whole world lieth in wickedness. You think they're going to teach the truth of the Bible in public schools? Huh? It's going to be talked about, and you'd be surprised at what your children already know. You'd be surprised at what your children already know. I don't care what age you think they are. I don't care how sweet and wonderful you think they are. It goes on in public school. And if it's a private school, they do the same things there too. My job is to make sure that I've done the best that I can do. What's yours? What's your job? Your job is just to turn the blind eye to it, ignore it away? Huh? Oftentimes, brethren, we wait too long. We wait too long, and then all of a sudden there's a mess made, and then now we got to deal with a mess. I personally believe in being proactive. You know what proactive means? That means we're going to... Deal with it now instead of waiting and being reactive and saying, oh, no, there's a mess. What are we going to do? Grab the bull by the horns, run him in the dirt, and say, stay there. That's where you're going to stay. Deal with it. Number two, Mary accepted the truth of Gabriel's message because she recognized Gabriel was from God. Now listen to this plainly. We must accept and obey the truth of God's word simply because it's God's word. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Mark. I want you to read a scripture with me. Look with me in Mark chapter 16. You remember Mary was reasonable? The angel came and told her some things that they're almost like, what? All this is going to happen to me? Well, what did Mary do? She was reasonable and she accepted the truth of Gabriel's message. Question, who put Mark 16, 16 in the Bible? 
Who put it in the Bible? My Bible says in Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and, does it say or? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. I have sat at tables, and I'm sure you have too. And you know the argument about this verse is about what Jesus didn't say. Jesus didn't say, he that is baptized not shall be damned. Why didn't he say that? Well, we can argue all day long about what Jesus didn't say. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Are you going to be reasonable and accept that? Or are you going to say, well, that's what it says, but that's not what it means. Well, what did Mary do? She sat there with the angel and said, well, I, I heard what you said, but evidently what you said isn't what you mean. Did, did she act that way? Well, how do you act with regard to Mark 16, 16? Mark 16, 16 reveals a lot about a person. <laughs> do you know that? It reveals a whole lot about a person when you simply sit there and read those words. Will you accept the truth of God's message? Well, Mary did. Why? Because she's reasonable. Number three. Mary understood the big picture. What do you mean by the big picture? Her son had to die. Her son had to live a sinless life and die for the sins of the world. Now, you can scour the Bible. You can. You have full permission, but I don't know that you're going to find anything of any indication at all where Mary tried to hinder what had to happen. Do you understand what I mean by that? Somewhere along the line, she realized her son was the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. So, what would you do with regard to that? Would you try to hinder it? Or would you see the big picture and say, this has to be. I can't, I can't stop this. This has to be what it is. Brethren, we got to see the big picture too. We got to see what's best for the Lord and his church. There are times where we may have to take it on the chin. You understand what I mean by that? There may be times where we have to take wrong in order that good may occur. Do you always have to have your way all the time? Or do we have to take things on the chin sometimes for the church so that the church can benefit and that the church can grow? You need to think about that. Let me give you the strongest practical lesson I could give you about Mary. At some point in her life, Mary sinned just like the rest of us. At some point in Mary's life, when? I don't know. Does the Bible record that she sinned? Not specifically, but the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All there is qualified by all those who are of the age of accountability and of a sound mind. At some point in Mary's life, she became an accountable person to God. And at that point, she sinned. She did something to miss the mark that God had set. And at that point, she needed a Savior. It just so happened that she was privileged enough to birth the Savior of all mankind into the world. And if Mary, when you read in Acts chapter 1, was gathered there with the believers, you know what Mary did? Mary submitted to the truth of the Lord's gospel. Could you imagine submitting to the gospel of the Son you birthed? Well... Something to think about. The Bible declares Jesus of Nazareth to be the Savior. Mary needed a Savior when she sinned. Who was her Savior? Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what Romans 6.23 says. The Bible says Jesus claims very boldly that he is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way to get to the Father but by or through Jesus Christ. How do you think Mary got to the Father? Through Jesus Christ. How are you going to get to the Father? Through Jesus Christ. How do we get to the Father? You have to start somewhere and it starts with hearing the truth, Romans 10, 17. Once you hear that truth, you must believe it, Acts 16, 31. Accept it. Accept the truth of God's word. 
We must repent of sin. Acts 17.30, God expects it of every person everywhere. We must confess Jesus as Lord, Acts 8.37, just like the Ethiopian eunuch did. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we must be immersed in water in order to have all our sins washed away, Acts 2.38. And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And brethren, from that point on, we're added by the Lord to the church. We're in Christ, but we have to walk in the light. Walking in the light means that when we as Christians sin, we repent of that sin and we confess it to God, 1 John 1, 7 to 9. Whatever you need is, realize where you stand. Mary, at some point in her life, had to realize she was lost. Do you realize you're lost? Think about it as together we stand and as we sing a song of encouragement.